We have said in previous videos that the seven deadly sins, or capital vices, each pervert a fundamental human love, a love given by God to thrust us towards our true good. Now, since the capital vices twist such powerful loves, they stand at the head of a series of other sins that flow from them. So how does lust fit into this equation? Our Heavenly Father, in His goodness and wisdom, has provided His creatures with everything they need to survive and thrive. His greatest gifts to us are deep drives and desires to pursue those actions which are, in fact, necessary for our thriving. For example, all creatures, as they travel through life, have a need to heal and recover from wear. Thus, God has attached great pleasure to the acts of rest and sleep, so that we may promptly rest when we need to recover. Creatures need nutrition for their, from their environment in order to survive. Thus, God has attached great pleasure to the acts of eating and drinking, so that we swiftly take in all the food that we need. Also, for our species as a whole to survive through time, we need to reproduce our like and to procreate. Thus, God has graciously attached great pleasure to the act of procreation, so that we not only move ourselves to acts of sexual procreation, but even take great satisfaction in doing so. So we can see a pattern developing. For everything that is good for us, God has attached an accompanying love, giving birth to a desire for, and finally a joy in the attainment of that thing. But we human beings are fallen creatures, and sin has distorted all of our loves beyond right reason, that is, beyond their original function. These loves are now not only distorted beyond the rule of reason, but they may become harmful. Thus, taking pleasure in excessive eating to the point of harming the body is unreasonable. It's the capital vice of gluttony. Also, taking pleasure in excessive sexual acts to the point of harming the very good for which those acts were given is the capital vice of lust. St. Thomas says, Lust consists essentially in exceeding the order and mode of reason in the matter of sexual acts. But there is a fundamental difference between sexual acts, which are good, and other acts directed towards our good. When I sleep, I aid the restoration of my individual body, not yours. I can't sleep for you. When I eat food, that act of eating is ordered towards my nutrition. I must eat in order to preserve my own individual life. I can't eat for you. But sex is different. When we engage in sexual acts, we do not do so for the preservation of our own individual lives alone. Sex is not about individual self-preservation at all. Unlike sleeping or eating, sexual acts are ordered not towards the preservation of an individual human life, but towards the preservation of the human species as a whole, the next generations, the community. This is a key point that we must understand to unpack the evil of lust. You see, all desires and loves are ordered towards some good. For each good, there is a different love. But not all goods are the same. Some goods are higher than other goods. The preservation of individual life is indeed a good. It is an individual good. But the preservation of the whole human species is a greater good. It is a common good. Now, the common good is always greater than the individual good. St. Thomas teaches, just as the preservation of the bodily nature of one individual is a true good, so too is the preservation of the nature of the human species a very great good. And just as the use of food is directed to, to the preservation of life in the individual, so is the use of sexual acts directed to the preservation of the whole human race. And what is more, God has attached greater pleasure to, and a greater desire for, those goods which are higher and more universal. So it stands to reason that since sexual acts are ordered towards the whole human race, God would attach a greater pleasure to the good of sexual acts 
than to other goods. This point is key. Sexual acts are not about the individual. Now, there's a lot of vain talk in the contemporary world about spontaneous sexual expression being integral to flourishing individual personality. But this is largely nonsense. Sex is not about the individual at all. It might be something done by individuals, but it is not about the individual. It is about the other, the community. It is about the common good. So what does this tell us about the vice of lust that distorts sexual desire? Since the good to which sexual acts are ordered is a higher good, the distortion of these acts is, likewise, an attack on a higher good. In other words, when sexual acts fall from the order for which they were created, the order of reason, they become even more unreasonable and more damaging to the person and to society. St. Thomas explains this. The use of sexual acts is most necessary for the common good, namely the preservation of the human race. Wherefore, there is the greatest necessity for observing the order of reason in this matter, so that if anything be done in this connection against the dictate of reason's ordering, it will be a sin. This is why lust is a deadly sin. Lust is a sin not only because it perverts one of our natural longings, but even more because it perverts that fundamental drive within us to move towards another. Sexual desire is designed to thrust us out of the cloister of our own narcissism and give ourselves wholly to another in a way that serves the common good. First, the common good of the family, father, mother, child, and then the common good of the whole human family. When lust perverts sexual desire, it, more than anything else, distorts our love for others, sets us in isolation, and removes us from an order to the common good. This is why lust is a capital vice that is the head of a series of daughter vices that flow from it. Since the common good is such a great good, sexual desire is such a powerful desire. And since sexual desire is such a powerful desire, the perversion of that desire corrupts not just our body, but our mind as well. Actually, St. Thomas insists that lust, more than any other, distorts our capacity for right thinking. Lust, he says, applies chiefly to sexual pleasures, which more than anything else work the greatest havoc in man's mind. Lust, then, has seven daughter vices, and these, interestingly, are vices that distort one's thinking. First, there's blindness of mind, by which we simply ignore truth. Second is thoughtlessness, by which we fail to judge. Third is inconstancy, by which our passions prevent us from any consistent commanded action. Fourth is rashness. Fifth is self-love, by which we are turned more and more into ourselves. Sixth is hatred of God, by which we turn away from divine things. And seventh, love of this world and the abhorrence or despair of the future world, both of which cause our very desires to turn completely from God. This is why lust is so evil and in the Christian life, chastity so valuable. Only those who practice chastity, whether single, married, or consecrated, can be rightly ordered to the community and ultimately to God. Only chastity and purity can ensure that our very minds are clear from the disordered thoughts which cloud prudent thinking. This also sheds light on the beatitude given by our Lord. Blessed are the pure of heart, they shall see God. Brothers and sisters, keep studying. This is Father Brad Elliott for the Western Dominican Province. You've been watching Truth in 60. For more exclusive videos, download the OP West app. Link is in the description.